One thing that I did realize that I had a, that I really needed to, well, upskill in is because I knew that I wanted my art to become a business, I knew that there were certain um, commercial skills that I needed to acquire. And I don't mean business skills, folks and welcome to the in search of adventure show i'm your host peter d and i'm coming to you from the adventure club room where we reignite your curiosity for an extraordinary life making sure you have all the skills in place to take back control of your own story this episode our action hero guest valerie koo rediscovered her artistic side and then very quickly managed to make money from selling her new art Making money from a beloved hobby is something I think many of us are curious about. So let's get on and hear about her adventure. I'd love to welcome the fabulous Valerie Koo. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Valerie. Great to be here. Thanks, Peter. When we first met, it was through a, a course, an entrepreneurial course, and you were at the Sydney Writers' Centre. Now, did you start the Sydney Writers' Centre? Yeah, so back in 2005, I started what was then called the Sydney Writers' Centre, but as we very shortly after that expanded into Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth and yep. online and have students from all over the world. So now, so yeah, shortly after that, we changed the name to the Australian Writer Centre. Mm. And um, yeah, and, and you basically expanded geographically. And so that was about helping budding writers sort of come out of their shell and actually turn into people that could either maybe not necessarily make money out of their writing, but certainly get that first book out and, and take some action. And also there was some business writing and all sorts of things. Wasn't I mean, the, the program actually has lots of choices for just getting that inner, inner writer out of people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, everyone wants to write for different reasons. Some just want to get a book out or a particular story out and other people do want to make money from it. And we absolutely teach how to do that as well. So if you want to write for pleasure, you want to write for profit, you want to write for, you know, whatever personal reason you might have, there are different courses that can guide you into that particular direction. And I think that came from the fact that I, because I started my first career off as an accountant right. and, and I, even though I had an inner desire to be a writer because I didn't think it was a real job, see that part. So I became an accountant, of course. And um, then when I finally realized that I needed to give writing a go, I had gone to so many different courses, centers, training providers, you know, everything you could think of, workshops all over the place, which all varied in quality. Some were very good, some were not good at all. And they were very inconsistent in terms of their teaching, in terms of, well, in terms of the quality. Mm. So what I really wanted was to create the kind of centre that I wish had existed when I was exploring the world of writing and that would be really credible and that would be professional, wasn't operating out of a church hall um, and that would be able to give real useful guidance from industry professionals, which some of the places I had gone to um, did, but many didn't. So I really wanted to create a hub that could reach people all over, you know, all over the place um, to, to help them in their path, whatever their, their, their particular writing goal was going to be. So that's clearly a creative endeavour, so writing is, um, yeah. but what it seems is you're still bringing that process and structure to it. Like there is a way to approach that. It's not just sitting cross-legged in a room with a pen and paper <laughs> and waiting for inspiration to strike. I've tried that. It doesn't work. Um, so, yeah. so to bring that sort of logic, which I think you clearly have, to the process of writing plus the creativity, it's an interesting combination. You know, it's an unusual one to try and bring that yeah. to I think a framework is very useful to people. Mm -hmm. And because when um, I've always been a course junkie, so even when I left school or even, even during university and after, you know, after university, I did courses in many things just because I enjoy learning, not necessarily because I wanted to become, you know, a, a florist or whatever. Yeah. I just wanted, I just enjoyed learning. And I, 
got to see teachers who had some kind of framework or structure and teachers who would just talk, you know, about whatever topic, yeah. which was still, which might've been interesting, but didn't give you the tools then to be able to do it for yourself. Yeah. So yeah, very much it's about ensuring there's a very clear framework or blueprint or, you know, step-by-step process for people to follow depending on the kind of writing that they wanted to do. And it's an interesting, even though I was excited to get hear, you hear about your art, because it's an interesting pivot, even though I guess it's not a huge leap, but um, I also believe that anything can have some sort of framework. It doesn't mean that yeah. you're going to be, you know, a um, James Patterson or, a, or a, you know, the, the best writer in the world, but it gives you that first step because the first steps are horrible. You know, that's what stops a lot of people is, but what do I do first? You know, and a framework has that thing that has the one next to it that <laughs> says, do that first. Yeah. <laughs> exactly that's exactly right and you know it could lead you to be the next James Patterson so mm. Candace which is at the Australian Writers Centre you know when I first met her she was she was writing away she she enjoyed writing crime she enjoyed reading crime and eventually her first book came out and then her second and then her third and she won these awards and then she met James Patterson at a cocktail party and she said, we should write books together. And then on their fourth book together, and one of them debuted as a number one New York Times bestseller. So it can make you the Jet Nick Jets <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so, that, so you've been helping people pull it out of themselves. Were you, in terms of then, you know, leaning towards your art, were you the sort of person that always had a sketchbook in your bag? I mean, I, I went to school and you knew uh-huh. people like that who had that, that little artist in them and they're constantly doodling or, or painted walls all the time or, you know, there was something that they constantly did or was this something that came out later in life? Well, here's the thing. I only let it out later in life, but the clues were always there from a very long time ago. So I remember in year seven that um, in art, because we had to do art, mm-hmm. I even re- see it to this day, the, a picture of an elephant that I drew. And I even sort of thought to myself, gee, that's really good as an elephant. <laughs> but then in year eight, you had to pick electives. and art was an elective and I thought art was and I really enjoyed art but I found it easy Mm -hmm. and I um, thought oh I can't possibly do art because it's too easy I need to do physics and chemistry and you know (laughs) advanced maths and stuff like that so it was a ridiculous approach you know um, I realized much later in life like in my 40s that your genius is what comes naturally to you. Mm. And I think sometimes we think we we don't do the things that come naturally to us because they already come naturally to us. Instead, we pick, oh, we've got to master that thing. We've got to conquer that thing. And in fact, that's a bit counterintuitive. Maybe you should do it the other way around. Mm. So that was, that was a bizarre decision, but you know, I was in year seven and I didn't know much better. No one kind of taught me these things. (laughs) And then, Throughout life, I think the biggest clue is that even though I didn't sketch in my spare time, largely because I didn't know where to start, the biggest clue was I get this professional organizer in every six months or so. And he helps me declutter, clear my cupboards. And every time she would say, look at these art supplies. You haven't used them since the last time I I came here let's throw them out I'm like, okay so we throw them out and invariably before she came back the next time i would have gone out and bought some more <laughs> and they would just sit in the cupboard i would bring them home you know full of expectation but then they would sit in the cupboard until the next time the professional organizer came around <laughs> and every single time she would say look you're not really going to use these you haven't touched them at all they're, they're taking up space let's throw them out And invariably, I would go buy them again. So that was the biggest clue to me. Mm. But I never allowed myself to use them, often largely because I didn't know where to start in some of them. And some people say, just start. That's, you know, easy to say when you're not sure where to start. Until finally I did um, start and I went to some workshops. And I think that was the important thing because that gave me a point to start and I remember the first workshop I went to and I was like I didn't even I wouldn't even put anything on the canvas till the teacher you know was standing next to me and I'd say is this all right and um 
but of course then that opened the floodgates and, and the professional organizer finally, you know, came around recently and she looked at this whole floor of the house now that's now our art studio. And she went, Oh my God, finally. <laughs> <laughs> you're using your art materials, not only using them, but I actually got her to come in to, to organize my studio. <laughs> that's hysterical. And so you went to a workshop and so clearly that sort of bracket open for you. So, okay, okay. I now know what to do or how or where to start. And so I'd imagine there was a fair bit though of, was there a bit of secrecy then still for you? Were you still sort of doing it in, in a room and painting and not sharing it with the world necessarily at that point? Was there a point where you sort of got comfortable to go, Oh, I'm going to tell everybody I'm doing this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got comfortable straight away because I didn't take it seriously straight away. Okay. You know what I mean? Cause it was just fun. I was just, it was just, I, I had no problem sharing it with it. We're sharing it in the same way. I had no problem sharing pictures of my cats yeah. in the same way. No problem sharing that I'm having a gin and tonic now, you know, it was just what was yeah. happening in life. So I actually had no problem sharing it straight away because I didn't think straight away, Oh my God, I'm a serious artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it was a very, very natural thing to share. And, um, but it was then it resulted in a lot of, you know, encouragement from other people and co and commentary and, and people asking if they could buy stuff. And I, then I went, Oh, huh, maybe, maybe I will, I could take it seriously, you know, and I had to think about that. And, but by then I was used to sharing it because it was just a fun thing I was doing anyway. Oh, well, it's probably a fantastic approach with any of these things, isn't it? If we don't, take it too seriously ourselves. Nobody else will either for starters, so it'll be light in their approach. Um, and the natural cheerleader in people always steps up with those things. People want to congratulate, often because they secretly would love to do it, right? They'd be thinking, oh, I wish I'd gone to that workshop. You know, I can just see that. You would have had a whole lot of friends that would tell me where that workshop was. I want to go. I've always wanted to, to do painting, you know, so I can imagine that being people's reaction. Um, was it, but I, I still think there's probably a moment you had where you're getting all this tension. People were thinking, Oh, I'd love to buy some, you know, a piece of that art and you're, but that's not a real job thing came up again. Did that, did that appear like did, maybe underpricing or anything like that? Was there a hesitation about the value of the work? Um, I didn't think too much about that when people were asking me if they wanted to buy some pieces, the, the turning point for me was when, and I'm sure you can relate to this, was when I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm earning some money, I'm selling some stuff and, and that's fine. I want to tax deduct my expenses. And my partner is the single most conservative um, person on earth when it comes to tax and yep. he is so by the book it's crazy and he said there's no way we're tax deducting anything because you're not earning enough sure. and you know, we had big discussions about this. <laughs> and he and I said well when can I tax deduct and he said when you're earning you know a certain amount whatever yeah. the amount was it was yeah. quite a significant amount at which point I was like oh my god um all right that's it I'm gonna earn that amount and so that was the turning point for me was when I had a financial goal yep. and so I had that first financial goal in order to, for it to be a real business and um and I met that and then I realized oh okay that's possible I wonder what it's what's um possible if then we change the financial goal yep. you know to the next obvious milestone and then and so on I really love the idea of the tax office providing some momentum <laughs> for a dream that's creative. That's like, that's just mind blowing. <laughs> it's, yeah. I really hope it's a tax accountant, someone here realizing the impact they can have. <laughs> drive for people to achieve. That's just amazing. What I also love though, in, in what you've done too, is you haven't let go of the word smithing. So I noticed mm. I'm looking at your um, Instagram page here and I notice a series you've called flying apostrophes. Yeah. That's clearly some crossover, isn't it? You're, you're not sort of letting go of the words or the impact of words in your art. Yeah, that's right. It's something that I started. I just, it sounds really weird, but I feel compelled to paint these apostrophe <laughs> and and paint them in all sorts of scenes and all sorts of you know compositions and all sorts of scenarios and it's just something that 
I just feel compelled to do. And so, and I find, I'm finding that's one of my, you know, most popular series because it's, it's certainly popular with writers mm. for obvious reasons. Um, I think people just think it's quirky and like the idea as well, because it is a quirky thing, you know, an apostrophe, but yet it could be in a very complex and moody kind of composition. So yeah, it's a bit of a weird thing. <laughs> well, and they've got natural movement too. And I think as somebody who has not an artistic bone in my body, um, all mass, you know, I'm all mass in my DNA. You um, never know, Peter, you oh, just got it. Right. You know, give it a go. And, and actually the things I have been attracted to in art are things that apply math. So mosaics, so things where yeah. you can, you know, there's, there's logic and things that, that do attract me. But I think, I think the, you know, the apostrophe has so much movement um, in it already. Yeah. And then you place that on something and it'll get even more momentum and movement. And so it's interesting when I look at um, the sort of pieces you've done, then as somebody who obviously knows very little about art at all, there's a, it's very accessible. And I'd imagine that's what people responded to, you know, because I think a lot of art, we sort of stare and think, I can't see that on my wall. And I'm sure somebody's very clever, but I don't want to put it in my house. You know, every time I go to the art wall, that's what I'm thinking half the pieces. I'm like, okay, you're clearly very clever, but it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's one of my main aims is I actually want people to put the art on their wall. I want them to like it and enjoy it and think it's nice and think it would be something that would be, that would look good on their wall, whether their wall is at home or an office building or, or whatever. And so there is, there are obviously artists who create art to make a statement or to make a, you know, whether that's a political statement or whether that's, you know, some other commentary on society yep. or a commentary about their lives and that's great and that's mm. there's an important place for that and you know there's uh, a lot of them go into museums and that's that's also fantastic um and it's like I was in an art fair once and there was an artist and I was drawn to a particular piece of art and and I was talking to the artist and she said oh that depicts and I was really uh, quite liking it from an aesthetic point of view mm. and she said oh that depicts my seven living the suffering I went through through seven years of drought. Wow. And I was like, I mean, I'm have empathy. I'm empathy. Of course that mm. you went through seven years of drought, but that's not an energy I want on my wall. <laughs> and, and I totally get that some people can disassociate themselves from the story behind the art. But for me, the story behind the art is so intrinsic that, um, that I wasn't then, I couldn't see that, that that piece in the same way again. And I, and I want people to appreciate and, and connect with the story behind the art that I create now. Like I say, as a novice, then when you do go through a gallery and you know, there's pieces that the world of art would expect you to appreciate, you know, it's a bit like poetry, like you should really like this. It's very good. <laughs> and then, and the, the trouble I have is, is it's very difficult to get that gateway through to the point where you can, access that because it, clearly over time you could you know and you'll you'll be able to see more in it but I think you know we need more and more of this sort of accessible art on all sorts of levels all sorts of mediums to help mm. people make that entree um and the, I mean one of the ways I've I've done it with a girlfriend so we go to the Archibald uh, for those of you that don't know that's a prize in in New South Wales particularly just New South Wales Australia um yes. or, or anyone Enter. Yeah, and it's and for portraits, and so we go every year. And what we've done is gamified it. So we have a game where we have to write down who we think the winner should have been. Oh yes. Who we put on the on our wall. So who we'd actually love to buy the piece, and then the WTF award goes to <laughs> what the f. <laughs> Like seriously, <laughs> what is that? And so it's it's made it um, the whole thing feel more accessible to us because we're yeah. just walking around and and That's grading it and we're talking about it and you can sort of hear some of the art people around us sort of giggling at the way we're reacting mm -hmm. to things. But I think it does make it a bit more accessible. And I have to admit the the apostrophe series you've got there actually, if I was to describe what it looks like, it does look a bit like a giggle, doesn't it? Like there's a <laughs> there's a little bit of laughter in that sort of look of the shape. Um, and I think yeah. anything that's a bit lighter like that can really help people sort of uh, access something that they might not otherwise. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that's really important is that, that it's something that people are going to connect with and don't have to think too hard about. <laughs> mm, mm, exactly. It's break brain to be able to access it. So did you find that there was anybody 
previously or even currently in either your colleague circle or, or friends and family who sort of struggled with this concept that you were taking this so seriously as to sell your art? Like, was there anybody that sort of seemed to really, <laughs> that's not who you are or, no, 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 you're the person over here that journalist and, and your writer said, but like, was there anybody that really struggled with that? There's always an, in, almost everyone had an initial shock because <laughs> they'd just go, you? <laughs> <laughs> Or they'd go, okay, um, so you're an artist now. But because I've done that sort of, because I do kind of out there things so many times in my life, they, they kind of, they, they get, they're used to the fact that I I will do something different. So even though there's an an initial shock, they, um, they get on board very quickly because they know that if I've decided to take something seriously, then it's going to, you know, I'm going to take it seriously. So (laughs) they're very encouraging. Right. <laughs> and was, do you remember the first piece of art you sold? Like how that felt when somebody actually paid for, do you remember how that felt at the time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just thought it was great that somebody, you know, wanted to buy something. And, and I had a few people in a short space of time um, want to purchase stuff. So, and a couple of them have, they're collecting, a couple of them have bought second pieces um so that was great yeah it was it was really cool <laughs> and it wasn't hard to let the pieces go you haven't had one where you've where you've liked it so much like mm, i don't want to sell it <laughs> no i think that comes from being um a freelance writer for decades you write so many articles and once you file it once you're done you, you know and you file the story with the editor um it's done Fantastic. you know yeah I, i'm not precious about keeping it or whatever. <laughs> and do you think actually, cause it's interesting when somebody's experienced at writing too, you get better and better at, I hesitate to use the word efficiency, but in terms of actually being able to complete something and, and let it out um, into the world. Yeah. You're finding that's applying to the art as well, that you've managed to bring that so that you don't just overthink and rework and let it sit there unfinished. That is absolutely so true. I was only thinking of that the other day because one of the biggest mistakes an artist can make is they can, it can actually be finished and then they keep on going and then they wreck it. They go too far because they think they'll just fix this tiny bit, fix this tiny bit. And that did certainly happen at the very beginning. But I had, I kind of reminded myself that as a writer, only because I've, you know, been writing for decades, Mm. um, I, one of the skills I have is I know how to end a story. Right. And I know when it's end and I can actually just feel the end that it's the end of the story in my body. Yeah. And, and that's really useful because then I don't overwrite yeah. or I, you know, tinker and tinker and tinker. I just know this is the end now. Sure. It can do a, pr- you know, with a few tweaks here and there, but it's the end. And I thought, you know what, you've got to apply that same feeling to art. And I realized that now I can, I, I apply the same feeling. So I actually know in my body when a piece is finished and I'm not tempted to rework it. And I know when it's unfinished too, because my body tells me there's a feeling that, Oh, something else needs to happen in this. Um, But uh, yeah, I, I, I had to think, you know, that with writing. So just apply the same physical process to art. Mm. And so it's almost a, a, the confidence you've built in one medium. You're sort of bringing that into one. You've probably not as confident in, but you're going, you know what? I could do it over there. I can do it here. Um, and it's probably what we don't do enough of, you know, when we learn something new or we're applying something that we've even a new business or diving in where we can take things from our history, where we can apply some of that stuff and yeah. bring those skills and that confidence, even if it isn't a place where you're experienced that confidence in. And sometimes confidence is all you need to get you over the line. Yeah, absolutely. That's, <laughs> you've, you've nailed that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is, it's really funny, I think, because I, a lot of people I chat to, I think, believe that it's skills that get you over the line. And it's interesting because a lot of people have skills. Like we can all go to workshop, you know, we can all do that. And of course there's natural ability, you know, there's, there's that. Sure. But, you know, I really do think that belief confidence which i guess is the manifestation of that is something that can just drive you through it sort of powers you through a bit knocks the demons over that is 100 percent correct it is the belief that it's 
possible. And that confidence is also the things that makes you put your hand up, yeah. you know, or opportunities or even seek opportunities. So sometimes if you're not confident, you don't, you're closed to the yeah. opportunities that might be right in front of your face. So I think that, um, yeah, that confidence can just give you so many more opportunities just because you become more aware of them and you have, um, you're more likely to put your hand up than, than, than not. Yeah. Um, and was there anything that really surprised you being harder or easier than you expected when you actually started selling the out? Like, was there anything that you figured it'd be super easy and took ages to set up or vice versa? Packaging. <laughs> really? <laughs> Oh my God, I did not know it was going to be that hard to, you know, because some of it, the small pieces are fine, but the large pieces, the effort that goes into packaging artwork well and properly is more than I expected and more time consuming than I expected. Wow. That's, that never would have entered my brain as a thing beforehand. No, and we probably would discount the difficulty required, right? Like we're just, surely that'll be fine. You know, it's like, just like a big envelope. You know, like I, I can see you going through that logic and it's always a yes. us up, isn't it? We're just so exactly. blind to all of the different layers of expertise required. Yep. Especially when it's big, you know, cause mm. some of my work is big, the smaller stuff's not hard, but yeah, I mean, try and find a box that's that big, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and often when you're doing something like this, that's out of your wheelhouse, you of course don't, you don't know the people like there's always going to be people that do these things. Like there'll be somebody yeah. out there who's the, the person that's the expert in this. And the minute you call them, Oh yeah, yeah, no worries. We can do that in a day. Or, but you don't know that because you're not in that crowd or you're not in that world. That's exactly, exactly right. And I have now found that person. Thank yeah. God. But for ages I was just going, this is just not worth the time. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully now that's all sorted and I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and have you found there's um, any opportunities that have come out of this process? So I, I saw, I didn't manage to get to the Lunar Festival, the Sydney Lunar Festival, but the pre curation of that, did that have any connection to your artwork or that process? Well, I think that as a, the city of Sydney's curator of the Sydney Lunar Festival, it's, um, it was very important to have an understanding of the art world and artists and the pro then the creative process, because, yeah. um, it's dealing with so many artistic elements. It is essentially an arts and, cult arts and culture festival. Yeah. And, and it's so important to be giving, providing input in, in the creative decisions for the festival. So definitely, you know, the, my art, my background or my work as an artist played into that for sure. And was there an element that where you potentially were more empathetic in terms of supporting the artists that you corralled into that <laughs> process? You know, sure. Maybe a little bit more empathy. <laughs> yeah. Understanding the creative process is, is very, very important because it's quite a, um, fluid and dynamic and it will process that's different for every creative. Yeah. So um, it's actually when you're dealing with different creatives, it's actually working out what's the thing that's going to help get them over the line or what's the thing that's right. going to support them. And it is different for different people. Yeah. And often I wonder whether you've seen that in yourself. So I find interacting with people who sort of leap into these adventures, um, which it clearly is uh, for you, <laughs> that they've generally got a leaning towards something. I guess the, I think one of the things that is that, that you're to always be learning. So, um, I don't hide the fact that I'm continually going to workshops because you will always find something that you can learn. I think some of the most successful artists still go to certain workshops because they will always learn new ideas and techniques and, and yeah. stuff like that. Largely also because I don't necessarily, even though I, I primarily I use painting mm -hmm. and primarily I paint in acrylics. Yep. I go, I typically go to workshops about other mediums. Right. So, cause I want to learn about inks. I want to learn about Chinese brush painting. I want to learn about watercolor. I want to learn about woodwork. I want to learn about, you know, mm -hmm. um, sculptural stuff. And I, when I learn it, I'll know again, it's like a feeling in your body, whether, I'm going to do that again, again soon. Yep. It's like, Oh no, oh, that's totally for me. And I'm going to incorporate that somehow, or that was a nice day, but it's not <laughs> something that I'll probably pursue kind of thing. 
Yeah. And so, and sometimes it'll just be some small element that I'll then incorporate into my artwork because you, you don't know what you don't know. So I think it's Correct. always important to, to keep on learning because it can only improve your, well, whatever you do in life, but in, in this case, artwork, yeah. And particularly, I think actually the more you learn, the more you realise you don't know. So oh, that's, that to me is the yeah. true sign of somebody who knows what they're doing is they know what they don't know. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, I'm not an expert in this, you know, and I think also they understand both depth and width of knowledge i think oh, people yeah. think you know being an expert or, or intelligent is this deep it's only deep and i'm just not a believer in that i think it's being able to go broader than that you know and so yeah. there's dimensions to your understanding and that's your point like with these workshops it's sort of spreading it a bit wider or well, what else could i apply myself to let's mm. try it out you know what what harm can come of that and i think because then of course you get those lovely cross intersections don't you where you can start to do a bit of both and and yeah get something that's just more appealing and probably more you over time. You probably get a little bit of everything that, that builds a complete sort of look. And I think that the th one thing that I did realize that I had a, that I really needed to, well, upskill in is because I knew that I wanted my art to become a business. I knew that there were certain um, commercial skills that I needed to acquire. And I don't mean business skills because I was already kind of confident mm. in the business side of things, but in terms of digital skills, Right. to do with art, which is one of the reasons then last year I did a diploma of surface design. So I somehow fit that in. <laughs> <laughs> it arrived in the mail actually the oh, other day. My <laughs> diploma. And because I re there were some skills with, you know, uh, uh, design with um, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, everything that, uh, that I really wanted to have under my belt um, so that I could then leverage the artwork into the digital space. Mm. And that was a very important thing that, um, an important skill that I didn't have, I felt. Yeah. And that's why I did the diploma in order to get those skills. Yeah. And I think, like you say, it, there's, there's no harm in learning more. We don't need to commit to a three year intensive <laughs> bachelor's degree in this stuff. There's so much out there that you can learn from. I don't know whether you've seen the masterclass series that you, uh, have. Yes. and I mean, even just start with one of those, like just something oh. that you can watch and engage with. There's so much out there just to get a taste of something to work out whether we enjoy it or it lights your fire and then go after it. I mean, there's so many things I hear friends or family or even colleagues mention, oh gee, I've always wanted to, and there'll be some yes. skills they want to learn. But well, why aren't you? <laughs> That's exactly right. And I've, you've hit the nail on the head when you say you don't have to commit to a diploma or a degree or whatever. Do a two-hour workshop, you mm -hmm. know. That's just, just, just to dip your toe in the water, just get a taste. You know, the first one I did, there's a place down the road that does these really fun workshops. And the first one I did was, <laughs> of all things, crochet a rug, at which point, I was like, after the class, I'm like, I'm so not going to pick up crocheting rugs. <laughs> I don't even know why I went to it, to be honest. <laughs> but I subsequently went to other workshops at yeah. the same place were, that, that really did speak to me. So, yeah. you know, just, just try things out and don't take them too seriously. Like when we were crocheting that rug, we were drinking champagne. <laughs> so... Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, our lizard brains get in the way and um, I've even heard my, you know, listen to myself say these sort of things where, but I'm going to be hopeless. Like, you know, I'm going to be terrible at this. And you've got to remind yourself that everybody else there is choosing a beginner workshop in that thing. They're not yes. going to go to a beginner workshop if they're an expert. So you're surrounded by your people. You're all hopeless. Like embrace that. Yep. Just all enjoy yep. that. Just go have fun. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And surely if you go from that place, then you'll find something that really, you know, is magical for you. Um, or you'll find people that you want to yeah. surround yourself with. I'm sure you've actually changed or added to your circle of, of friends oh, from because you've met quite different people. Very different. I mean, there's so many more people now that I know about the art world and the art world is its own. Isn't very it? 
different little world. So yeah, I'm learning about other communities, which is which has really been quite an eye-opening and fun experience. It is, and I, as somebody who um, I've got a friend who owns a gallery, and so you sort of are aware of things, but not really in them at all. And and I became convinced there for a while that there was literally like a membership card for the art world. Like there was this. It, it's <laughs> such a they have its own language. It has its own. Like it's really yeah. interesting. It's and it makes sense because this is you know hundred years in the making. This is not something that's just popped up on say Instagram, right? The art world has been around a long time. And so of course it's going to have some really richness into the way they interact and, mm. and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'm deeply fascinated. I have to say by that whole environment. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Mm. My personal question that I've always wanted somebody to answer the series of three pieces of art that go together. And I think you've produced a few of those. How do you, how do you say the word that describes what that is? <laughs> so some people say trip tick and yes. some people say trip titch and you know, it's spelled T R I P T Y C H. And you will get two different opinions, no matter how, no matter who you ask, it's the weirdest thing. So it's true. We need to get the definitive right. answer to that, but you will get two people or two opinions and they will argue back black and blue as to who is correct. And I'm not entirely sure. Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you. I feel much better about that. <laughs> So, not the only one. so in terms of then sort of wrapping us up, I just love to get an idea of looking back when you were a kid and you were lying in the grass, looking up at the clouds, what did you dream of being? What did you want to be or who did you want to be? Wow. That is a really good question. Okay. So I didn't really lie in the grass and look at the clouds too much because I thought I would get dirty. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, if I was lying in bed looking at my ceiling, well, this is a really weird thing to say, I know. But uh, at the time, I used to tell people, you know, when I was 12, whatever, I used to tell people, I'm going to be a businesswoman. <laughs> <laughs> what, that's not weird? I just liked this idea, you know, and I got a briefcase as soon as I could. And I just liked this idea of going off and to an office I love offices even to this day I love offices um and the you know the first thing I did when I moved into this house was I got an interior designer just for the office <laughs> I love it I Get love the it the house, the so I just um I didn't know what that meant at the time being a businesswoman I had no clue in fact <laughs> but something about it spoke to me I just liked the idea of working and I worked ever since I was 14 and, um, and it's weird because I had quite a creative side as well. You know, I was into music and, and, um, a lot of creativity, but if you did ask me the question, um, yeah, what I wanted to do when I grew up, that's probably, that is what I would have said. Partly also because I didn't think it was a real job to become a pianist or a real job to become an artist or a real job to become a writer. So it didn't, that wouldn't have even been in my vocabulary as a job to do at the time. Obviously I realize now that I was very wrong, but that's, that's kind of my framework at the time. And isn't it interesting that even today that would come up, you know, you've got parents, maybe got kids in year 12 or something like that. And that would be the instant response. Yeah. But that's not a real job. You can do that in your, in your, your off time when you're relaxing, but what are you going to do for a real job? You know, and it's funny given how much exposure we have to all the variety of creativity and wonderful things we can do that we still have this narrow view. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah it's bizarre, but yeah, it's, it's true. People still do have that view what I'd love to know is something that you have in your dream list that's a bit far off. So it doesn't feel like it's the next thing you're going to do, maybe a bit out of reach that you'd love to experience or do or travel to or learn um, that's on your list. Is there something you've got out there that feels a bit big and challenging that you'd love to do? Um, I've never said this out loud to anyone in my life. <laughs> I'm excited. I, don't know. I don't know if I can say it out loud. We can keep it just between us, if you like. It's too scary. <laughs> and you're one million listeners. Yeah, um, it's too scary. Okay. 
I would love, I've always wanted to be in a musical. Really? <laughs> oh, that's, that's not a crazy thing. That's a fun thing. It's a fantastic <laughs> idea. There, I mean, the, the local communities for musicals are crazy and awesome. In fact, they're, no, I would no, imagine, no. On, on oh, you mean a, big, a Broadway musical? <laughs> right, 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 we want to go big. Broadway or bust. Not, you know, Rockdale Musical Society. No, no exactly, none of that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> How fun. But interestingly, a similar interesting community to the art world, right? The yes. theatre and musical theatre world, own language, own mm. pecking order, right? like it's, it's quite, it's similar and long history as well. Yes. Yes. So there was a period, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, maybe more, um, uh, that I thought, okay, well, how do I get to be involved in the musical world? And I thought, oh, well, I can't, you know, I'm not good enough to sing or dance or whatever. Maybe I can be an accountant for Cameron McIntosh or maybe I could do PR for, you know, um, whatever, the book of whatever the big musical were, yep. <laughs> was at the time. And so I did play around with that idea and then I can't remember what happened. So it's obviously been a long-standing um, thing where I, cause I just love musicals. I love watching them. I love listening to them. I love singing to them. I love everything about them. I love dissecting them. I love, yeah. you know, um, you know, I've done theses on them. I just, I, yeah. I, I love them. <laughs> I'm right there with you. There is something, there is a unique joy you get mm. out of it. It's quite unique. It's hard to replicate in anything else. And yes. I think it is the, singing dancing storytelling live music like it's it's all of these things in one hit that you can't really find anywhere else i mean even opera can come close but it doesn't quite get the same it doesn't generally yeah. have that same feel i don't know it's so magical i will never yeah. forget taking um, my nieces to you know their first set of musicals and just like the eyes, yes. wondrous world, you know, and they feel like that every time for me. Um, mm -hmm. When we travelled to, you know, New York or London or anywhere like that, I could happily go matinee evening, matinee evening, matinee mm -hmm. evening for like two weeks straight. My poor husband likes to limit me every time we go to have, yep. you know, because they're just wonderful. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for sharing that with us. I think that's just fantastic. <laughs> Um, I think it's, I'm probably going to have to add it to my list. I did do 20 years of tap dancing training. So while, oh while I would be horrendous if I went back, it is something I even auditioned for a, um, a show one time. So, so yeah, I could be right there with you. We'll have to find the right one where we can be, you know, tree one and tree two up the back or something. <laughs> Just write our own. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you so much, Valerie. We'll look forward to chatting to you next time. Thank you so much, Peter. Wow, we really went all sorts of places with that conversation with Valerie, including her secret wish to be in a Broadway musical. How awesome is that? In fact, if you are someone that could make that happen for Valerie, please reach out to me because I think it's such a wonderful dream to have on her list. Something that actually stood out for me during our conversation is that basically all her life, Valerie has been curious happy to explore new skills, new types of creative pursuits. And because she approaches it just as an exploration, then it takes the pressure off the outcome. You know, it then just becomes about enjoying the experience and not taking it too seriously. This is something I think we can all learn from in our approach to new things, whether they're, you know, creative or not. Simply be curious and just see what happens. Now, if Valerie's adventure inspired you particularly then, feel free to head over to the show notes where we will include the links to her podcast, the Australian Writers' Centre and all the other things we mentioned throughout the interview, along with all of her appropriate social handles so you can follow on with her varied adventures into the future. And if you enjoyed the interview and want to be sure to know about your ones as they go live, then be sure to subscribe to the show on whatever your favourite podcasting platform is. 
Up next is our action tip segment. Uh, the wonderful Hayley Pierce and I will chat about a narrative we often tell ourselves about our hobbies, particularly the creative ones, and how we can in fact push past that to head well outside our comfort zone and really enjoy ourselves. So Hayley, having just uh, chatted to Valerie, something interesting came out of that uh, that I thought was worth covering off. And this is, you know, Valerie's a really successful person, but there was a number of times she talked about how she convinced herself that say, you know, whether, whether it came to art or other things she was interested in that were creative, that you just can't make money out of that. Right. And that as part of our upbringing, we're taught certain things are appropriate jobs or careers or places oh, to make traditional money. traditional money. Right. Yes. Um, and certain things, pff, there's no way you can make money out of that, right? And, and I thought, you know what, that actually, I reckon that had come up for a lot of people. Yeah. And it would mean something they love, maybe even a really good at, they'd never take that little bit further. Being stuck as a, a hobby or something yeah. they just do out of hours on the weekend that they just don't pursue because it doesn't make money. Yeah, and I and I think, first of all, there'll, there'll be that inner voice where we've just convinced ourselves we can't. Yeah. And then I think also that we do the all or nothing. So it's either, well, either I can make $100,000 from it or I won't make any money. Like it's this <laughs> extreme. It's, right? it's also surely the trade-off then between... Yes, whether it's whether you can make money out of it, but it's also you're clearly passionate about it and yeah. enjoy it. And that's got to be a big value add for you to pursue it at all. Definitely. And what if you pursuing this and maybe, as in Valerie's case, started off just selling some of her artwork to friends and, and colleagues. What if those sales merely meant that your art supplies got paid for? Yeah. Like what if that's the first hurdle? is, hey, you've just covered your cost to do this and so I can keep on doing it. Yeah, and I think that when it's you're trying to turn a hobby into a career or, or a passion into a career, you don't just start at $100,000 no. <laughs> a salary. No. It is a process. It, it, is. Is, it happens over a period of time. So if it's turning, for example, say you've got a side hustle um, and you're working full time, you can there's a process, it's a build up to going, okay, now my side hustle is my full time gig. Yeah. But you don't start at $100,000. No, and also I think the world is so flexible these days. So we do absolutely have the opportunity to do some extra work on Saturday or to say, you know, convince our boss that we'll do a half down Fridays or to like whatever that is. We are far more flexible now. So you can step into these things. Yeah. It isn't, whereas I still have conversations with people where they're like, yeah, I'm debating whether I should quit to start this new thing, but they've never actually operated in that space. They've never done yeah. a little bit of it. They've never, you know, it's like, wow, it's, really? It's, <laughs> it's really backing yourself on your side hustle. And yeah. I think people think side hustle has to be some online shop or blog or job that, I mean, people make money out of anything. Yes. But I, I can't even think, but there would be so many different areas. Absolutely. There could be all sorts of things that you love that you could turn into something that earns money or at least um, becomes a part of your life that's sustainable, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we were chatting earlier and things like, baby yoga yeah, yeah like i don't think that probably came about because suddenly they identified a market i reckon it was probably a mum going i love yoga and i can't <laughs> not take my baby so yay baby yoga <laughs> and there's all the variations of that you raise yeah. your point so um there's like doing yoga with wine right uh painting with wine like mm. there's just you pick two things cross them that's something that you can do as a side hustle yeah so i guess i guess the point out of that then is don't be stuck in this um, this mindset of it's not a traditional side hustle or it's not a traditional job. I therefore shouldn't pursue it. Yeah, yeah, and it's. I think there's sort of two distinct parts of the community. I think, and there's some of us that are in this side hustle world where there's a lot of that, and I think the entrepreneurial space we all talk about that a lot. There's a whole lot of people that wouldn't even know what that means, you know. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is something that you're passionate about that isn't your core earner maybe not your full-time job, but it's this thing on the side that you love that you expend some energy on and also has an aim of earning some money. And yeah. that's now a fully acceptable thing. In, in fact, you know, some people will say it's a way to get balance. Yeah. You know, it's a way to, to balance the day job, which you may not super love with a side job, 
but you do. It's also a chance to expand your skills. Correct. Um, doing something that might not be directly related to your, your full-time job, but yeah. something that definitely expands you know, the things that are on your resume or your LinkedIn profile that oh, just enhance your career. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's about, okay, there's something maybe you love doing, giving it a whirl, having a bit of play, um, and then go and see if somebody else is doing that or is making money from it or is at least has a, a small business on that. And I guarantee you there will be something somewhere. I just don't believe there's many places that people haven't tried over the world. Yeah. You use the Google and I can tell you there will be someone which will prove that you can, should you choose to. And then make a realistic expectation for yourself out of what you want to achieve. So don't say, right, well, I'm going to quit my job and I'm just going to try and do this. Oh, look, if that's what you want to do, feel free. But why would you need to? Yeah. You don't need to, do you? You can just say, you know what, I'm going to try and make... 5k yeah next year let's just see if we can make you know so pick a figure and just sit out oh i got that done it, wow it, it's definitely setting some shorter term goals right and, and testing it out yes that you might absolutely have a crazy idea that doesn't seem like it would work as a business but give it a go test it out yeah and you might identify that it works in part if you diversify it with something else right um you might find a community of people doing that and you could be a part of a group that do some stuff like you just You've got to start mm -hmm. and step into it small yeah, and just try it out, yeah. you know, and gradually work towards it. And like we'd spoken about, um, I think in an earlier podcast now, the just being afraid to fail a little bit at that. Yeah. That this is the first time you're starting this side hustle or first time you're fully backing yourself into a, a hobby, you're not going to get it perfectly right. No. Uh, but it's about having a go and learning from that. Exactly. And it might not be the right one now. Yeah. But you giving it a, go, it a go, you will absolutely learn something and you'll learn something about yourself too. Yeah. You know, and so I think um, we can, in, oh, I'm really passionate about this thing and it has to succeed. If you were able to step back, you'd go, actually, I might be passionate about a broad thing. This one version of it is, a, is just a trial run of it. Let's yeah. see if it works. Yeah. You know, and maybe there's a different run. Yeah. Um, that will get it done you know so I think ultimately the message here folks is I believe you can make money from anything mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't necessarily need to that's the first step yeah. maybe you just get square yeah. you have enough to cover your costs and you get to do the thing you love yeah. um, but you can should you want to and just start small give it a crack give it a crack exactly <laughs> and enjoy I'm hoping our discussions so far have got you really revved up to head out and start living life like an action hero. If that's the case, I would encourage you to head over to the Adventure Club Room, which is our private Facebook group and is basically, well, a support group for action heroes in training just like you. The link to the group is in the show notes or you can simply search for Adventure Club Room in Facebook. Next up is our Popcorn Adventures segment, where we take a bit of a pivot from our everyday action heroes like Valerie and look to fictional action heroes in movies to see if they inspire any dreams we maybe have forgotten to add to our list. And we'll also debate whether they actually measure up as action heroes at all. Our movie today is in a series that always shows us a good time, if perhaps not very good behaviours. The movie I'm referring to is Ocean's 12. too hot to work anywhere in this country. Where are we going? You're doing recon work on our anniversary? Tez. And you are Mr. Miguel Diaz. What's your name? Craig. Greg. Let me ask you something. Do you have safe deposit boxes here? It's not in my nature to be mysterious. I can't talk about it and I can't talk about why. Well, that was the trailer for Ocean's 12, not 11, 
number 12, <laughs> which was released uh, in 2004, directed by Steven Soderbergh. Now, for those of you that don't know that, that director, if you're not into the film, film stuff like I am, he did Aaron Brockovich. So, you know, oh, yeah, he's done he some decent stuff. He does. And he's done traffic. He's done a lot of other stuff too, but he's a pretty um, awesome director actually. So the IMDB description uh, is pretty succinct for Ocean's 12. Danny Ocean recruits one more team member so he can pull off three major European heists in this sequel to Ocean's 11. That's <laughs> what I am <laughs> Well, there's a lot of reference there that you don't have to understand. <laughs> now, folks, the reason um, I picked uh, Ocean's 12 was with the lovely Valerie Koo talking about commercialising her art, I wanted something that had art galleries maybe a heist yeah. and so that's where you know this one sort of stood out for me and the fact that it's so so fun mm -hmm. so Haley, 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 were there any dreams that this movie particular movie inspired to go on your list uh well i've never been to vegas so <gasps> that is one thousand percent on there yes um and that's a big one so i mean there were so many little things that you could you could take from this the whole concept or oh, not the whole concept but where it all started is that um, the boys had stolen a stock certificate. Yep. Um, and it made me think, you know, I've not been to any of the stock markets around the world. Like cool. been to the ASX here in Australia, but just in all the other yep. um, Chicago. companies, like yep. A, a yep. country, sorry, that it would be really awesome to go to, to that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, for me, it not surprisingly hit a whole lot of locations I've not been to. Yes, I've not been to so Amsterdam. Many. I've not been to Lake Como, which is definitely on my list. Yeah. It just seems beautiful. Rome, haven't done that either. A number of these my husband did before we were together, so we, we will never speak of that again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I would actually have... I put on my list, which is one of those things that folks you're allowed to have, which is a ludicrous, it's probably never going to happen thing. But I'm a big believer in not second guessing our dreams. We write them on the list. And the one for me is I want to meet Bruce Willis. Oh, that's a good one. I just think he would be wry, funny. He'd have a lot of charisma. You'd, you'd have a beer with that guy and I reckon you'd have a fantastic time. A hundred percent. He, You know he could hold conversation. There'd be no awkward silences. Absolutely. And sort of pretty chilled, I reckon. You know, yeah. I just don't think he'd take himself too seriously. The, um, I guess the weird dream I, I didn't pick up on was I'd so love to have a go at zip lining. Ooh, like maybe yes. not between two skyscrapers. That's a bit, that's a bit much. But how epic would it be just to like, I guess it's like a giant flying fox, but yes. the whole wearing black with a balaclava and, you know, from safety to another safety point, that works. But yes. that would be cool. Zip lining would be cool. And you can do that in all sorts of weird and wonderful places. I didn't mm -hmm. know that. In fact, I think there's one in the Blue Mountains, even just outside yes. of Sydney. So they they are everywhere. So that's a fantastic one to put on your list. Whoa, we're adding so many. This is so cool. <laughs> so... I think it's fair to say we both enjoyed the movie, yeah? Yeah, it's a good, it's a classic and it's part of a series. So, you know, it's hard not to get on board with exciting stuff like that. It is. And I have to admit as a film, as a cinephile, I love watching a group of actors who are clearly having the fun of court. Yes. <laughs> Like you can tell it's almost like they just go threw them into a room and just went, you guys all just okay. have fun and we'll just record it. You know? That was funny when I had watched it again uh, more recently I was like, oh my gosh, there are so many celebs in this in this yes. movie. But the first time I didn't even notice it, but it, it started a bit of a theme where it was cool to have just jam-packed movies with every celeb you knew. And they just Absolutely. kept coming each scene, another celeb, another celeb. And I loved it. Absolutely. I mean, these days we see that a lot in Marvel, don't we? But yes. this was well before that, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just bringing in a whole lot of people and, and the way they all sort of drive and get there, they were all quite differently cool. You know, yes. I mean, there's all lots of cool in yep. that group, but quite different in the way that they manifest that, which I sort of love. It means you can sort of pick one that you feel like you're a bit more, more like that one. You know? And especially with in this movie, 12 people, for people to be able to, I guess, identify with a bit. Like if you, yeah. if this was a boy band, <laughs> you've got lots of options. You do. Complete you diversity. Do. Like there is no, there's no question there's diversity in this movie. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And I personally love the fact that Rusty, so Brad Pitt's character is always eating. 
It just yeah. cracks me up. Everywhere he is, he's got something running down his hand, eating a burger or something. It just, he clearly made a choice as an actor to do that. And it cracks me up. I then start waiting for it. I'm like, yeah. I know he's going to be on, on, you know, scene soon. <gasps> Yep, there he is, he's eating. Oh, I didn't I love, even love notice it. that. Oh, it's so cool. That and also I think um, the fact that the music becomes like another character in these movies, they do the music beautifully. Yes, yes. And it just adds a vibe that is so, so cool. Yeah. And I think something you'd probably miss in, in other movies. Now, you know, we need to sort of do our little action hero assessment here. I have to admit, I sort of figured we could assess them as a team. Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, when I, was, pick, right? I was sitting there thinking with the spread of them, there really was a balance between some of them that were woeful with their money. They'd already spent the, the previously stolen money. Yep. Um, some of them had some and a bit more. So there really was yep. a complete spread of different types of money management amongst yes. those guys. Yes. And I think, yeah, if we look at it as, you know, finance action heroes, what's really interesting is they, like you say, are disastrous on the spending side. Yeah. Like, like really, truly disastrous. Now I think they each from the, from the payout from the first movie, I'll try to remember it was millions. They each had like millions, like 160 million or something. Right. Right. And lots of them had none of that left. It's like, dude, yes. what did you spend that on? Like, how could you? And it's only three years a year later, or something. Like, it's not long later. How did you blow your as share if, of that money? As if I'm calling out on that. If you were given 160 million dollars and you looked ah. at your dream list right now, I wouldn't see you. That's true. That <laughs> is very true. <laughs> that is very true. But what I did like is actually. So if you take out their spending, every other behaviour they they nail. Their ability, so when they're heading out on adventure or a mission, they fully run the numbers, right? They're fully across what things are going to spend. They've got contingency plans. They, they sort of work it all out. They round up their numbers too, which I like. So a lot, a lot of yeah. when we go on an adventure, go, oh, that holiday should only cost me 2000 It ends up costing us three and a half. Whereas these guys are like, yeah, we've got a quote here. Let's round it up because we yeah. always know, you know, that sort of stuff. I thought that was really cool. They had, I don't want to spoil the movie if you haven't seen it, but there's some awesome backup contingency plans they put in place at the beginning, Yep. you know, which is super cool. Um, and I think there was a funny one there that occurred to me. We've, we talk about the fact that you might be attacking something big, but you just start with a small step. And for these guys, they needed to basically come up with a, over a hundred million dollars. So they started with a $2 million heist. Yeah. I'm like, Fair call, you know, yeah. like, you just need to kick things off. Feels like a big target, <laughs> but you've got to start somewhere, which I truly loved. I thought it was so awesome. They also, um, it's interesting on the spending front, you could say that they're into things, I guess, and we sort of encourage people to be more into experiences than things, but I reckon actually they live life pretty thoroughly, all of them. You know, like they seem to know themselves pretty well. And I guess they're also able to pick up and move to wherever they've got to go. I mean, just like that, they were all on a plane to a completely yes. different country. Like I'd have some calls to make. I'd <laughs> have to arrange some things. They were just up and out. Um, it was yep. all, it was all organized. And I think I loved, um, you picked up on some really good points, but the, what I'd like to add is that the sense of community that, Yes. As a tribe, they worked together. That yes. They sort of kept each other accountable. They had each other's backs. And I think there's such yes. strength in that, that um, it's so easy to be, to feel ashamed of um, getting on top of your money or struggling to get on top of your money. So we definitely don't speak about it. Um, and whilst that wasn't the case with these, these guys, they <laughs> had no issues with their money, yeah. um, but it was a camaraderie um, in sharing the experience together. And I, I think if you're going to take anything away from these guys, finance action heroes, it's find a money buddy that is going to help you keep you accountable, motivate you, um, challenge you, push you because I mean, you could have $160 million, right? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't steal anything, but yes, you could. Do it legally. <laughs> I think, so there were some other traits, it was, and it's really funny once you start clinically looking at this stuff. So, you know, we always suggest that people question the norm. Don't, don't allow the society or what people expect to define your dream list, right? Really attack it yourself. But, and there's this wonderful quote in the movie where they're talking about a challenge they're facing, right? And they're looking and they're trying to solve it. And they said, look, you know, within the current physical environment, it's simply not possible. 
and they all look at each other and they're like, well, so why don't we change the physical environment? Yes. I love that. Right. And I'm like, how cool is that attitude? Like, yeah. yes, challenge, difficult. Just let's pivot. Yeah. That is such a good point. Just being able to pivot. I think when they break into the, when they're doing the first heist, they break yes. in and um, you find out a bit later that it was, someone got in ahead of them. Yes. They just change plans. Yeah. And it's so easy with money stuff to just fall apart when things yeah, throw don't work out. And definitely you're allowed to feel um, how you need to feel, but being able to pick yourself up, pull your socks up and redirect is such a, such an amazing quality to when it comes to money stuff. It is. And the other thing they did that, um, that I don't think we do in adventures nearly enough. And this came back, came up, sorry, back in the Nick true episode with the airstream yep. is doing a dry run, doing practice runs, having yes. models of things, um, making sure you've done enough research that you can run through it as a practice run. And that may seem silly for a small little thing like going away for the weekend. But if you are doing, if you are moving interstate or you're doing a tree change or a sea change, then to do a dry run, go and go and visit for a holiday during summer and then go back in winter, you know, like really give it a, good try before you do these big things and they were fantastic at that absolutely and i mean talking about side hustles opening up uh, the the art gallery um you know using the people around you to soundboard our ideas like that yeah that's you know using your team using your oceans 12 yes. to come up with ideas of how you can turn your side hustle into the thing of your dreams or um, anything that you're struggling with is there's such power in that. Yes. And even tapping into experts. So they had a gentleman that they, who was actually in the first movie as well. And I love is this British character and he's yep. this sort of funny tech, but really nerdy tech expert. Yep. And, you know, they call him in when they need to and pay for his services. And I think a lot of us resist that um, in all facets of our lives. We might do a bit of local, you know, it's stuff on our home and we just do it ourselves instead of bringing somebody in or all the way through through to even money help. And so sometimes you just got to bring in the person that'll get it done, get it done yep. properly. And you just pay a bit of money to get it done. And so I thought that was helpful too. You know, it was yes. really interesting that if you can ignore the spending, that <laughs> 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 actually these guys hit a number of highs to, yep. for me. So therefore I sort of, I sort of said that basically they, I would have rated them about an eight, like really yep. good. Yeah, but I felt like I needed to deduct two for the spending. Like um, <laughs> I just couldn't get past the fact that they they'd blown like tens of millions of dollars. They're definitely up there. They're towards the higher end than they are the lower end when Tr it comes correct. to being a finance action hero. Correct, and lots of lots of traits I reckon we could all learn just a little bit for at from. <laughs> and in fact, if nothing else, and you haven't seen these movies for a while, go back and watch again because. Yes with a glass of wine and some cheese, sit back and just have a good old laugh and, and enjoy the giggle. ride. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Ailey. Thanks. Love this episode of the In Search of Adventure show? Then make sure you subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. We love all feedback, so please don't be shy. And we'd love to hear about what's up next for you because there's an adventure story out there simply waiting for its action hero to step up. And I'm pretty sure that Action Hero is you.